St. Vincent, Edley, uh, Dunbar's asked for prayers. I think there may be a link in the announcements about what that, yeah. that prayer need may yeah. be. Okay, yeah. I'm reading that. Okay. So Stephen and Dana still on go for sat still on go? <laughs> no, we, you know? we moved it up now. Still on go, okay. Okay, still still can RSVP that if that's still okay. All right, very good. Absolutely. All right, glad. All right, maybe one of three. All right. <laughs> Jerry's going to tie that knot on there. All right, very good. All right. Um, thanks for that. In conjunction with the uh, winter shelter, there's going to be some uh, de escalation training that will be uh, led by Kirby Fraley. That will be Sunday at 1 30 in the reception room. David, I want to book it, not to say book it, but include the fact that it's an informational. And the escalation. Okay, so the information about the winter shelter yes. in addition to we're gonna, some we're of the training. Talk about it. Okay. If you uh, would like to know more about what goes on, what is happening, all all the everything. If you have questions, please come with questions and ask, and and we'll try to answer them the best we can. But it's going to be inform information <coughs> and a escalation. Okay, thank you for that, Skip. All right, so that's good. That's good to know that and. Uh, a lot of good being accomplished in that effort. And uh, so that'll be Sunday at 1.30 in the reception room. Uh, the Leaf, Gad Leaf Man will be available on the, the 18th. You can see Daryl about that if you have those who might need that particular uh, service on that date. Uh, also, just a reminder that our Thanksgiving box Ministry that will be on the 20th, and that will be from six to eight. I'm not sure what that exactly looked like, given the the kitchen redo, but we'll they'll, they'll, we'll get ready for that. That'll be on the 20th of November, from six to eight, and preparing those boxes. All right, anything else by way of announcement tonight? <coughs> uh, David. Yes. Let's <coughs> pray for the young woman at Belmont College. Uh, her last name was Ludwig, uh, but she was shot. She was out walking on the track. Mm -hmm. she, they don't expect her to. She's an 18-year-old freshman at Belmont University. Oh, so this was on campus? On campus. Okay. Wanted to thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Huh? Anything else? All right. All right let's uh, take a moment and uh, think about these that we mentioned, others that you may know of, and uh, just take a moment and 
think of that, and then we'll get we'll get started with a, a time of prayer. <coughs> Our God, we'd like to take a moment and uh, reflect on this day with thanksgiving. To think of your blessings in this day, uh, we want to pause and be be thankful to you, O oh God, for how you have blessed us. And we give, we give blessings to your name, by the power of your name, that the world has been created and the world continues to function by your power. We acknowledge that tonight. We want to pause and think of those who uh, we're thinking about with prayer and uh, ask, oh God, that you would provide what is needed in, all of the, in these circumstances we're mindful of some of the challenging things that happen in this world we're saddened by the shooting of the student in Bel at Belmont uh, certainly saddened by that uh, our hearts are uh, concerned about the continued upheaval in the Middle East and uh, we just pray oh God that there could be a, a peaceful resolution to all that conflict we're prayerful of that we recognize it's we recognize its complexity but we also would ask that uh, people of people that have love for humanity uh, people that have some understanding of the 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 cost in terms of human life and and the innocent the innocent people who suffer in these kinds of things that those people that they might come to recognize uh, the need that there might be some ending to that. So we're prayerful for, we're prayerful for that tonight. Uh, for those who are having surgery, those who have been recently hospitalized, those who are uh, struggling with different types of things in their life, oh God, we, uh, we're mindful of that as well. We want to pray for the upcoming opportunity to minister to people that need some help uh, by opening our facility to, to folks during the cold weather for the training and the efforts that are being put forth for that. We pray for Kirby and her presentation. We pray for Skip and Kim and others that are uh, providing the information about that upcoming ministry. Uh, we would also, Father, acknowledge the, the complexity of that and how we, how we might minister to people sometimes that are in di very difficult uh, emotional, physical challenges. So we're mindful of that tonight as well. We are very thankful. I hope you are, Father, I, I know I am, to be thankful for people of, uh, of faith that gather different times throughout the week, worshiping together, praying together, sharing life together. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very thankful for that tonight, and I know we are all grateful for the opportunities that we have to share in life together, and hopefully, oh God, our, our faith will grow, and our trust will grow, and our appreciation for each other, that that will also grow. We are very thankful for the love you have, as we think about Jesus tonight, as we watch what he, as we think about what he had to say and how he interacts with people, we would ask that that would not just be a story to read, but it would be a true expression of what our heart desires for this world, is that it would come to know Jesus and would come to live in the way that he wants us to live, because we know, Father, that that is the way that you want the world to be. And we anticipate we anticipate the day in which every tear will be dry and there will be new heaven and new earth. There will be the resurrection. That's the hope in which we live. And I pray, oh God, that we can uh, remember and be thankful for that hope. For all these things we ask, for things that are unspoken, things that are, that are maybe deep in our heart, that are uh, hurt, hurtful, painful, that cause anxiety, may we claim the promise of Paul that when we pray that we can have peace. 
And we pray for that tonight. In Jesus we ask, and amen. Amen. <coughs> We are uh, spending some time in Mark chapter 10 this evening. Jerry, Jerry introduced uh, some of the material on this last week, and we were, we were thinking a little bit about, starting about verse 17, where the man comes to Jesus and asks about eternal life, and Jesus' response to him, and then in verse 21, Jesus looked at him, and I love, I mean, this is really, I think he loved him. In verse 21, he says, one thing you need to do, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have the treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. Not what he wanted to hear, because his face fell, went away with sadness, great wealth that he did not feel like that he could turn loose of to follow, follow Jesus. And we, we, we kind of ended last week with the idea that having conversations about our relationship to wealth, to wealth are not easy conversations to have. Is that right? Those are hard conversations. There is um, something within us that uh, when you begin to talk about finances and resources and those kinds of things, it uh, becomes a very challenging thing with which to consider. What is the one thing that Jesus asked him to do? And uh, I put that up here or not. What's the one thing, right? Uh, this may not be the one thing that Lord, the Lord may ask of you. I don't know. But what is the one thing? What is the one thing that that if we obey and we really do what it is the Lord wants us to do, what that might mean. So something to think about. Um, to say that we all don't have some conversation with ourselves about how we handle our own resources, I think would not be accurate. I think we all do that, right? We all have that. And um, some thoughts on that. So anybody want to, anybody want to speak? To, I kind of did that last week. Anybody want to speak to the idea of this, this person, the wealth? We mentioned that. Uh, you know, the, the, eye, the, the camel uh, going through the eye of the needle and how that's kind of tried, we, you know, folks have tried through the years to try to soften that somewhat by, you know, putting that in some kind of a different, you know, part of the wall or whatever, but we don't need to soften that because Jesus is saying, you know, you can't do that on your own. That, that, it ain't going to happen. You've got to rely upon God if you're going to address this idea of entering the kingdom and dealing with what this, this person is dealing with. So any, thought, any thoughts on that? I told you it's a hard conversation. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a piece in here that yeah. says that Jesus loved him. Yeah, loved him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and sometimes what it means to truly love is, is to challenge another person mm -hmm. towards a more life-giving way of living. And I'm, I think just developing a, a thirst to be challenged in that way would be a good thing for Christian people. Mm -hmm. For all of us to be open to that. That's right. It's good. Thank you, Jerry. It's good. That's right. To be loved. To be loved. That's right. Uh, we ever been corrected in an un unloving way? Yes. Can we can we think can we converse can we have conversations about the fact that I we we hear love coming through the conversations that we're having and whatever those are, yeah. and that's uh, open to that. Other you thoughts never, on this, you never this young man's little boy, Don. You yeah. never experienced that as a teacher. <coughs> of course not. <laughs> Correcting in an unloving way. Uh, it depends on how <clears throat> egregious the behavior is. Yes. yes. Uh, what made you think you could do that is sometimes my, my, my question. And the answer usually is, well, I just wasn't thinking. And yeah, you're right, you weren't thinking. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about 12-year-old kids, right? Yeah. Right. The 120 I see every day. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, Don, that, that's put the test quite often. You're right. I love you enough to tell you don't do that. You're gonna hurt. You're gonna get hurt, right? right? Yeah. That kind of thing. Uh, would you? I mean, you, as a parent, would you want? Would you expect a teacher to try to offer some guidance and keep your kid from doing something that might be painful or hurtful to them? I hope you would. Yes. But I tell you, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a culture where no, who are you to correct my kid? 
because I mean, you know, after, after, you know, bless their old heart, she wouldn't want to hurt their self-esteem by telling them not to do that. I mean, I mean that's that's real. That's real. Okay, I don't got on that soapbox, but okay. <laughs> Um, but I do, I do believe that when you begin to think about, we hear statistics all the time that a small percentage of the world owns most of the wealth, what, 1% owns 90% of it, that kind of thing, and how people struggle throughout the world to, uh, to exist, and we sit in lots of plenty, and that, that's a, a message we need to think something about in terms of Jesus loving, this, loving the person, but the one thing, right? The one thing that he was he was asked to do. Hey David, so yeah, Rick. many years ago there was a, a a book or a study called Rust as a Witness. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it was dealing with uh, money, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it, the thing, you know, this one here is dealing with someone who's very wealthy, right? It's, Would appear so, yes. Okay. But really, the application is really to everyone. Everyone. I mean, you know, it's not just to the, what we might consider the wealthy, right? Because I would consider myself extremely wealthy uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and it's really about, like we talked about last week, good stewardship mm -hmm. of what God has allowed us to have. And if we allow that to stand between us and God, then we kind of fall in the same camp. And I think it's really interesting that when it says impossible, it really, it, I mean, if you really look at it, I mean, those were the words that Jesus said. And his apostles were like, well, then who can? And he said, well, you can't. It's not possible. You on your own, it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. So, so what, do you, what do you make of that statement, that phrase, that, that phrase, all things are possible, that can be used in lots of different ways, right? So in this context, what do you think Jesus means by that when he says all things are possible? I mean, I'm not just you, Rick, but I'm just thinking, what is that, you know, what is Jesus really asking us to consider when he says that? The thing that comes to my mind is I think Jesus has that ultimate vision that no one at this time that in that place really understands what when the kingdom comes mm -hmm. and what that really means with grace, right? Yep. Because of the sacrifice of Him, mm -hmm. and it's because of that grace that turns that's God's fulfillment of possibilities. You know, when we place. when we fall or we sin. Okay. All right, good. Other thoughts on this person? <clears throat> well, Jesus, once again, as he does quite often, predicts that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to die. And Jerry mentioned last week in the lesson there was a little bit of a different type of... Uh, thought in that as Jesus talks about it in, in the idea of uh, being handed over to the Gentiles, going to be mocked, spit on, flogged, and killed. Three days later he will rise. So once again Jesus predicts what is going to take place. And he's been, Mark, Mark's gospel has, has been giving those thoughts along and along, right? And this is not something new that Jesus has just recently mentioned, but it's something that Jesus has try to keep before them when he has conversation about what the what the future holds. Well it's interesting here that in the midst of the, in the midst of that or, or on the on the end of that that we have this uh, request by James and John. And this is verse uh, 35. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Oh that's a that's a loaded one, right? Okay. What do you want me to do? I mean, I, I don't you love that? Okay. We want you to do it. I mean, all right, what, what, do you got? what do you got in mind, guys? 37, we want one of us to sit on your right and the other on your left in your, glo in your glory. <coughs> I 
you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> and then this interesting phrase, this one has, uh, this one sticks with me here. Can you drink the cup? I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am going to be baptized with. Okay, well, what does Jesus mean? They're going to get killed. Thank you, Will. They're going to, it's about dying, isn't it? Thank you. All right? And they are, do they, do they, they think that's, do they, is that what they're, is that what they're, when he says drinking the cup and baptized, is that, they're good with that? What do you, what do you, what do you think they're hearing? They say, we can, but I don't think they're thinking they're going to die. Okay, so let's speculate. So let's speculate. What do, what do you think they, what do you think in their minds is going on when they hear what Jesus has to say? What, what would they be thinking? If not, if not what Jesus predicts about going to Jerusalem, if that's not exa if that's not what they have in mind, what do you think they have in mind when they say we can we can drink and be baptized with your what, what, are they, what do you think they're thinking? Is victory over retaking Israel. Could be yeah, it could be that's right. I mean, the, the kingdom's coming and we're going to get what. We have been looking for, right? You're the one that's going to provide what it is that we've been looking for for generations. That may very much be part of it. Good. So, is there something? I'm just. Is there something about drinking the cup and being baptized with a baptism I am baptized with? What in the world is that? Okay. Well, what, let's, let's start with drink the cup. What cup is Jesus going to say they're going to drink? Or is asking, can you drink it? I think he's asking if they can be the sacrifice okay. that he's going to be. Okay. That's the real question. It is a real, it is militia. It is a yeah, that's right. It is a question before him. That's right. It's good. And Jesus has been trying for a while to get them to recognize what is coming. But it appears that to Ed's point, there is still this this thought in their mind is. It's about position. It's about power. It's about where we want to where we want to locate ourselves when we finally get you doing what it is that we long for you to do. Because that, obviously you're the Messiah, and we recognize that's what we're longing for you to do. So let me ask this question: You ever uh, you ever said something with really good intention, but? When you really stop to think about what you had said you would do, you you you, know, you couldn't do it. You ever had any good intentions and come to find out that you got a little bit carried away with yourself and you couldn't quite deliver on what you thought you were going to do? Is anybody or just me? Okay, I thought okay, just me. Well, anyway, so I don't know. Uh, but they're asking to sit. Places of power, places of prominence. And yet Jesus says, in order to do that, here's what will be required. And they say, we can do it. And Jesus says, well, okay, hey, you know what? You can drink that, what I'm going to, the cup I'm going to drink, be baptized with baptism, I'm going to be baptized with. But to sit, where you're asking to be to sit, is not for me to grant. So who's getting those places, Jesus? <laughs> okay. Uh, those belong to those whom they have been whom they have been prepared. That's an interesting phrase. Okay. Leave us leave us hanging there, Jesus, on that one. Well, the ten, the other the other guys, kind of they get they. I don't know whether I mean I'm trying to get some feel if it is like James and John were bold enough to ask this in the presence of all the other guys there. You know, maybe they I, I wouldn't doubt it. But they heard it, and they were, they became, uh, my mind says, indignant. Anybody got anything else besides indignant in that in verse uh, 41? Anything else? Is that the, is that the word? Displeased. Displeased. Okay. What about being ticked off? That's, that's, that's a southern translation, yeah. My lost their tempers. Lost their tempers, yes. All right, so pretty upset with that. And... Uh, <coughs> What are you gonna do with that, right? You got uh, ten that are really upset with what James and John had asked. They they think that that is beyond what uh, perhaps they should have. 
And notice this in 42. Okay, Jesus calls them together. Now notice this leadership right here. All right? I don't know if we think about Jesus as, a, as sometimes as a leader. There have been books written about that, of course. But he calls them together. And here's what he says to them in verse 42. Are you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, that they lord it over them, and that their high officials exercise authority over them? I hear in that Jesus is saying you're well acquainted with how it works. How the, how the power works. That's how it works. Not with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you, you got to learn what it means to be a servant. And whoever wants to be first, you got to be a slave of all. For even, Jesus is talking about himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The song we sometimes sing, Lord, make me a servant, make me like you. You ever waited any, you ever waited any tables? When you, you ever waited any tables? Okay. Um, Stephen, you waited some tables for? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so what was that like? I'd rather cook. <laughs> um, one, of my, one, of my, one of my children uh, was, in, waited on, you know, was a waiter for a while, and uh, he talked about how that, you know, you do your best to provide good service for people. They spend hundreds of dollars on a meal, and they get to the end of that meal, and the tip is, you know, $5 on a... Two hundred dollar deal, right? Hard to hard to hard to serve at the table, right, Wes? Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I mean, it, it, it's hard to it's hard to serve, especially when you feel like you're not being recognized. And Jesus says, if you want to really be great, you got to learn to be a servant. If you want to be first, you got to learn what it means to what, slave. That's a strong word, isn't it? So what's the call here? What is Jesus asking? As he brings them together, you got the two over here they are all puffed up with. We want to be on the right and the left. you got the other two over here grumbling, grumbling about them. And Jesus calls those 12 together. He says, all right, guys, here's the real deal. Here's, what really, here's what's really important. What are you making what he says? What's, what's, the, what's the takeaway for how we might think about it? Put others above yourself. All right, Ken, good. Put others above yourself. That's right. It's good. Humility. Humility about that? Yes, that's right. That's good. I uh, there's a there's a movie that I that I show. Uh, it's the movie's called Radio. Anybody seen Radio? Mm -hmm. Hey, Radio's a good movie. All right. I think kid, you know kids. It's it's about a young man in a community in Carolinas. Nobody pays him any. Nobody. Takes, he's invisible. Okay, pushing his shopping cart around. Little town in the Carolinas, and Coach Jones <laughs> begins to pay some attention. He begins to recognize there's some value in radio, and it's a it's a, it's a, great, it's a really good story. And has, uh, but the the, the and I, I use that for the, with the kids. I say, radio's invisible to everybody. Okay, and I say, ask them, you, you ever felt invisible? And they and they'll go, yeah. Okay, uh, middle school's a place of invisibility. All right, school is wherever. Radio's invisible. Nobody pays radio any attention until Coach Jones begins to say, somebody needs to pay attention to the kid. And then the story kind of unfolds. If you've seen it, it's a, it's, it's a really uh, heartwarming kind of deal where you see the relationship that they're built, even though there's people that really don't understand radio. Well, here, you know, Coach Jones could have just been like everybody else and just ignored it. Instead, he chose to help and serve it. I think there's some value in that as well, right? You know, you know, anyone, who's, you know anyone who might be invisible? You ever felt that way? Being a servant, caring about others, and then he says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And then this word right here, to give my life as a ransom, a ransom for many. As you
as you might imagine, there's been some conversation about what that word, what that means. Well, let's think about it in our, in our as, we, as we hear the word ransom, what comes to our mind? What do we think? And when we hear the word ransom. Buying someone's freedom. Yes, okay. Well, yes, buying someone's freedom, good. Other thoughts on this idea of ransom? Buying someone's freedom, that's, a, that's certainly, that's good. So what do, I, what do I have in what do I have in that? If, if Jesus says I've come to be a ransom for many, what is what is what do we have to offer in that? Anything? If you're captive, you're powerless. Okay. The ransom sets you free. Where you're not powerless anymore. Good. Yes. Thank you. That's good. Rick. Thank you. That's good. Um, so what do you think about uh, Jesus died on the cross? So I didn't have to. You, you okay with that? Is that right about that, Randy? That Jesus died on the cross. So I didn't have to. Yes. Jesus died on the cross. So I didn't have to. You heard that right? Yes. What do you make? What do you make of that? Is that? Is that? You, is that? I, I sometimes kind of like. Is that really Jesus died on the cross? So I didn't have to. Is that right? I don't think I'm about this. I've heard that right. Okay. Uh, Jesus died in your place. Oh, here's a good one. It was substitutionary atonement. Anybody want to unpack that one? It was substitutionary atonement, right? You didn't come prepared to unpack that tonight, did you? Okay, I think so. Well, it's Paul's words, he tasted yeah. death for every man. Tasted death, yeah, death for every man, right? Good, yes. So, the lots of, my point is, lots of ways to express that. But here Jesus says, uh, ransom. You couldn't, you, know, you couldn't, that, that was my, my goal was to come in to be a ransom for people. To pay the price, if you will, pay for that. But it's in the, but to me it's interesting, in the context of this idea of serving, right? It's in the context of being a servant and the value of being a servant when he could have claimed to be the one who needed to be served. And he makes that, that observation about what he came to do. Right, any thoughts on that? Who was the ransom to? Who's being ransomed? You pay a ransom, you pay it to somebody. To someone. That's right. So, what's your thoughts there, Randy? I'm asking. You're just asking. <laughs> and how can we ever be grateful enough? Yes. That's right. In my theory, I, I think it's the righteousness and justice of God that's being satisfied, obviously. I've heard some suggest, you know, it's almost like we sell our souls to the devil and Jesus is paying that back. I don't think I go there, but, but that's... Yeah, got you, right. It's, it's easy sometimes to, to go here and think about the other ways that it's expressed in other places. Mm -hmm. I recognize that's there, but here in this, in this context, what is there? My thought was: Is there any connection between using the word ransom and what he had said earlier about serving? Is there a connection between those two things? I mean, that's what I'm. I mean, I'm asking, right? Is there is there some connection between what he has just said about what he came to do, and that is to serve and not to be served? And then he says, "Okay, this I came to, I came to, as ransom, right?" The ultimate act of service. Yeah, the I think that's right. I, think, I mean, he's, he's pointing to the ultimate act of service. If you're talking about the service, aside from the idea of dying, okay, the, of, of dying, of dying, I think ransom is this is this is a serve. A, this is my ultimate goal of serving humanity, if you will. Serving is this idea of ransom. I think there's, I think there's a reason why the word is used in the way that it is in this particular context, in the idea of serving and ransom. I think it's intentional here by Mark to do that. I, I, I think in Jesus too, you find. Um, now I really struggle with my own understanding here of what Jesus is talking about yep. when he uses the Son of Man language. Son of Man language, right? So I mean, I've I've been trying to listen and read Daniel seven at the same time, but it's interesting in Daniel seven, the Son of Man comes to be served. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the language there. He comes and he's set upon the throne of the Ancient of Days, and he is to be served. So that's that's the illusion that that we have with the Son of Man language. Um, but then Son of Man has to still meet what the suffering servant gets in Isaiah, what, 63 or 62? 
and that suffering servant language, in my understanding and and of in, in reading, um, there's this real idea that the suffering servant, the, the Messiah, would take on this role of suffering to undo evil. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you have the Son of Man metaphor meet the suffering servant? And I think Jesus is teaching about that somehow here in a way that's got layers of complexity that I don't necessarily understand yeah. because I'm just not a first century Jew and I haven't been given all that background of what it meant to hope for a Messiah in a world controlled by power and authority, not our own. Yeah. And that would come through a suffering servant. And what does suffering mean? You know, I've heard... Um, N.T. Wright talk about this, that suffering servant would take it all upon himself and somehow destroy evil, um, that that suffering servant would somehow make the suffering happen upon the authority that's in control, that, that you know, they, there's different paradigms and ideas about how that would come about, but yet Jesus kind of takes all of those and through the cross does it all. Yep. And the ransom is not just in the cross, it's, it's so that the metaphor of the Son of Man comes true through suffering somehow. I, I yeah, right, sure. I, yeah. Does, does that make... I, I, yeah. Well, I think, I think the, the, e the echo they would get from their, 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 the Son of Man, that when they hear that, there's something significant that they're going, they're going to hear that we're not quite as attuned. Is that fair? That we're not quite as attuned to, I would yeah, think. Yeah, I mean, in real ways, I feel like that section about the, the, the Savior having to suffer is like taken out of place because if you just go from Peter making that confession, we're all here, and then Jesus saying, well, you'll get a hundredfold. It just makes sense to go right into James and John saying, hey, Jesus, by the way, can we get first and second? You know, yeah. I, I mean, that kind of flows, but then in the middle of that, you have this language of Jesus taking them inside and, and, and teaching them that the Son of Man will have to suffer. And then you get James and John talking about this. So, so there's kind of this, I don't know, I, I feel like there's a learning process here that I'm not quite following the steps on. You follow me? Yeah, I do. I, yes, and that's, I hear that, yes. So or, so is it Mark's intent, let's throw this, is it Mark's intent to leave the reader a little bit Confused, confused, or bewildered about kind of what I don't know. I'm just I, I, maybe it is. I mean, sometimes we think about we read scripture and, and they're trying to kind of you know work it all, work it out. Maybe it's not a maybe it's a place where we don't work it out. Maybe it's a place where he leaves it there and asks the reader to consider the implications of all of that. Right? You've got Jesus' language. You've got James and John's request. You've got Jesus' language about what they say about what they can do, and then you have this language of service, this idea of ransom, and when you put all that together, Colin, you're right. It is very much. You know, how do you how do you kind of nail all that? I don't know how you nail that. Oh, right? Yeah, baptism kind of confused. Yeah, that is that's right. Sure. So that's there. Yeah. Okay. There yes. Peter, um, okay. when Jesus asked, you know, what what can I do to be saved, or what can I do to inherit eternal life? And it seems like it always turns it back to the kingdom. Yeah. yeah. And and I, I, it keeps striking me that. You know, at the end he says, I'm going to give my life a ransom for many, which is, you know, service, of course. But I think he's saying entering into the kingdom is going to be very, very difficult because it's going to change everything you've ever known and ever thought. It's not about who's going to be first on the right hand or left. It, you know, it's not going to be how much money you have. But I keep, I, I, it seems like people want something He's directing to the kingdom, and at the end he says, it's going to be very, very difficult. I, 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 am I off on that? Well, I, the difficulty certainly is there. I mean, that phrase, you can't do it, you're not going to be able to do it on your, with, without, you know, God's going to do it. I yeah, mean, that's we all want money and power, don't we? I mean, in some aspect, we've come through that. And that's just totally opposite kingdom value. All right, so how do people, that's a good, that's a good thought, how do people who live in a time of, Power and finances and resources. How do they? How do they? How do they calculate what it means to really die to that? Right? Not. Not. I mean, he was asked to give it all away and give it to the poor. Ouch. It's all about steps, right? That's a big step. I know, it's scary. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, to give it all away to the poor, come follow me. That's a that's a huge step. I don't. Uh, that's a huge one. I don't know. I could think of a lot of reasons why that wouldn't why I wouldn't do that. Okay, David. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I think about this 
concept in an easier to understand way for myself. I always think of that line in the song that we sing that says, he paid a debt he did not owe. Mm -hmm. And to me that means, that says yes. a lot. That's true, that's good. Yeah, that, that is, we sing that one and we, we acknowledge the debt that we couldn't pay that he paid that we couldn't, so that, that speaks to that. It's good, yeah, that's right. I mean, even if we died on the cross, that would not have paid the debt. That's, see, that's a good point, okay, because that's the point I want to make earlier is, because sometimes people talk about, well, if I just hung there like Jesus did, everything would be cool. And I, I, don't like, I don't like that, okay? I don't think that's how I would want to characterize atonement or whatever. It's, it's, not, it's not that, it is, there's... There are much deeper implications of what Jesus did on the cross and just, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, yeah, dying, but what are the full implications of that, right? Well, there are many places in Scripture where it talks about the shame of it, right? The shame of it, which we sometimes overlook. <clears throat> the idea that, yes, blood that was poured out, right? All that. And, and so we need to, there, it's a very multifaceted idea that you know, Mark kind of introduces here. Okay, yes. It's not just man on the cross. It's God. Yeah, that's on the right. Cross. It's God on the cross. That's right. That's, that's, that's yeah. That's not even close to comparison. Okay, that's that, yes. Thank you. That's right. Yes. Well, the lamb had to be without blemish, and I would not be without blemish on a cross. That's right. That's right. There's a church in town called King's Cross, and. And I like that name because it always reminds me that Christ is victor, um, Christ is king, and and the fact that that He comes uh, to rescue us from victory, he, he gives us victory through His yeah. death. Right. Right. There's that. I think it's in First Peter or Colossians where Paul talks about how He has. It was Paul or Peter talks about how He has rescued us from the. Dominion of darkness and brought darkness. us into the yep. wonderful light of the kingdom of the sun. Right. Um, so this idea that that realms have been shifted, that we have been ransomed from one sort of existence, which is pretty, pretty desperate and dull and full of wrath, and we've been brought into a new existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think part of this existence of um, of being free from has to do with with the way that people seek status. Status is always over and above somebody else. And um, you know, there was an article in the Times yesterday about these these new clubs in New York City with the, for the mega wealthy. Mm. And um, they they have their own places to eat and everything, and they hire their own chefs, and they just kind of have this this layer of existence. Um, it's just kind of make, but I, I just think that that's natural. Um, the way that money is just not an object; it's a force, it's a power, it's part of the dominion, and it can it can have its sway over us. And so it was the, the wealthy man and, and status, and mm -hmm. and then we see that you know we see that corruption of of those desires and of power. We see it sometimes in our Christian yearnings. Or how we would like our nation to be. Right. Sometimes right. you even see it in the church office. Um, I just think it's a real, a real force, a real temptation for us. And, and yes. there's something here, as you said, the, the word leader isn't used. There's something. So I always wonder, like, when Jesus comes back, is he, is he all of a sudden going to be different in the way he leads, or is he still going to be the suffering servant? If this is who God is, it is really hard to imagine what that kingdom is going to be like. Yes, it's, a, it's excellent. Um, how God suffers, how God is suffering, right? It's very key. Right, quick. Something that was said earlier wanted me to rethink this a little bit. Okay. Because um, you were, somebody was tying this about what Jesus says about himself or the Son of Man himself back to the earlier statement, statement about you have to be a servant of all um, and I don't know I'm, I'm just throwing this out there I, I, I don't know I think 
Collins writes, it can be very difficult to truly understand this. Um, but in, in, one, in the original language, the life, life, the word life is not life, it's soul. Okay? Um, and then it, and the soul, where have I heard that before, right? And I'm thinking of the great command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. What does that mean to love God with all your soul? And, and is Jesus playing on that in being a servant? You know, the, of giving all that you have for, for mankind in our walk, daily walk with God. So in, in, in almost in essence as if to love God with all our soul is to be servant to the point of giving ourselves as a ransom to those that are lost. Okay. I, I don't know. I, I'll think through that a little bit. Yeah. As you are too. Yeah. I, uh, it is... Um, I do believe that Mark is trying as, because when we get into the next section here, it's going to be less, it's not going to be teaching anymore. It's going to be moving toward the final act, if you will, of dying. Okay, Jesus has predicted it. And now, as we get into this next section, it is going to find its fulfillment. But until that time, here, it appears that, as Mark, Mark kind of frames this material, that he wants to leave the reader with a couple of things to really hang on to as like, we move into what's going to happen when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and the events of that time. But I want to, but I want to, I want to spend just a moment here with the end of chapter ten because the chapters and verses kind of do us a little bit of injustice here. Because in chap in chapter <laughs> chapter eight we have a blind man. You recall a blind man that Jesus. It appears that Jesus tries to heal him. And it doesn't come out exactly right the first time, and so there's kind of a redo in that story in, in chapter 8. Okay, there was like this healing, but it wasn't complete healing, and so there is, you know, what, what do you see? Well, I kind of see this shadowy. I had got it all back together then, and Jesus does a little more with him, and he, he now he sees. But here, in this in this end, I think there's a I think there's a bookend here. There's another blind man. Okay, the blind man at 8, and the blind man here in the end of, ten, end of 10. But notice what it says. I found this to be quite intriguing. All right, they come to Jericho. Jesus and his disciples together with a large, here's, here's Jerry mentions an intro, large crowd. Here it is. Another crowd is gathered. We're le they were leaving the city. A blind man, <coughs> Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. Now notice, notice what he says. This is intentional. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What is Bartimaeus declaring? Did you hear that, right? Hear that. Many rebuked him and said, be, hey, what are you doing? be quiet. But he shouted all more. Son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> Jesus stopped. Say, I right, call him. So they call the blind man. Cheer up. This is new, this is new, new, new NIV. Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. He threw aside his cloak, jumped to his feet, came to Jesus. I love, don't you love this with Jesus? What does he want me to do? Okay. That gets asked by Jesus. What does he want me to do? You didn't have the same question to James and John. That's, That's right. What do you want me to do? Okay. All right. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Right. Immediately, good word in Mark, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Okay, here's my thought here. Bartimaeus represents a fullness of understanding about who Jesus is. Everybody hearing that? Son of David. He acknowledges who Jesus is. Messianic language. Earlier in 8, we have a blind man that is still trying to work it out. 
I think there's intentionally there in terms of what is going on that with that blind man in 8, but here in this part of 10, it's kind of like this bookend where it says, now, here's a blind man who gets it. He's blind, but he's full of understanding. I don't, I mean, you not like that? Isn't that good? I mean, I, I just think that's, I mean, Mark, I, I, just, I just think that's good, is that, you know, we begin with a blind man who, I'm not really sure what's going on here, Jesus kind of works with that, and then we get to a blind man in the end of, of 10 who, who understands, okay, who is willing to proclaim the reality of who Jesus is. And it comes from a voice that no one in that society would have paid attention to. Can we please pause for that moment? No one would have paid attention to this voice in this society except Jesus because of what the man is claiming, Son of David, have mercy on me. He's making the ultimate understanding of who Jesus is before Jesus goes to Jerusalem. A blind man begging makes a full understanding of who Jesus is before he heads to Jerusalem. So what to do with that? Thought about that a little bit. So let me ask this question: Are we too are we too busy to be to be a, attuned to what God's doing? Are we too busy to, to notice that? Here's a blind man; he's attuned to it. He's begging. Are we too busy to, to legitimately hear what it is God wants us to hear? I'm just asking. I'm asking myself. Uh, do we desire Do we desire for more? You know, reach. Uh, do we live on the internet? You know, is it is it TikTok central? It is in my place. Okay, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just I think the blind man here in the latter part of this is is he 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 a legitimate sense of fullness. Okay, are we too busy to experience a legitimate sense of fullness? All right, so let me let me, let me give you a little, let me give you this idea. I've been, I've been reading a book. It's called The Congregation in a, in a Secular Age. Written by a uh, Luther seminarian, Andy Root. And he's written several books. He has The Pastor in a Secular Age. He's got a new book out about how we do it. His point is, how do you live as a believer in a secular age? Everybody hearing that? Okay. And he talks about that part of the challenge of living in a secular age is that we are enamored with busyness. Okay, you ask somebody, how you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good, but I'm busy. Right? As if that's a, and Colin mentioned this in class anymore, and, you know, business has kind of become the, the badge we wear to impress people. I'm busy. Okay, we got it. Busy. But Root, make, Root makes the, the point by saying there is this strong desire to always be reaching for whatever's out there. Did you see, did you see what happened? Did you see on the Internet? Did you see what this person said? Did you read this article? Did you wrote, listen to this podcast? Everyone, you know that, right? Nothing, nothing wrong with any of that. But Ruth would say, what is the end result of all that stimulus, all that reach, reaching? And I'm just, I'm just captured by the fullness of understanding by a blind beggar on the side of the road. So what, what okay, so help me um, see the light. Okay. All right, so when he said son of David, yeah. and, and he's at that time, what they're looking for, the Jews are looking for, he, is he using son of David as a physical kingdom on earth? Or is he actually acknowledging son of David with full understanding of what God is about to do with Jesus? Well, Rick, I think what he's saying is he's acknowledging the messianic the messianic purpose of Jesus by what he says. I think the I think the phraseology is intentional. Okay, when he says it twice, right? So there, you know, he's not he's not ashamed to say, "Cry out Sunday." Now, does, what does he understand in his own mind about that? I don't know. But Mark's wanting us to hear that as someone who you would not expect to be able to have much voice, giving voice to who Jesus is. That is, it is messianic language. It is much like Jesus saying, "Son of man," about himself. This is Son of David. He's giving that messianic message to the reader and to those who are hearing as he, he understands what whether he understands it fully I, probably not but the point of it is it is intentionally used by the, the blind by Bartimaeus here I don't know 
Does he, does he fully understand? Maybe not. But he at least acknowledges what Jesus is going to Jerusalem to do. Well, he says, uh, I want to see. I want to see, that's right. And the problem with Mark has been blindness. That's right. And this guy wants to see. Wants to see. And then he wants to follow Jesus after he, see, after he begins to see. That's right. That's good, absolutely. Yes. You think how powerful Jesus is as the son of David. <clears throat> you know, the fireworks for Bartimaeus have yet to come because he won't be declared the son of God with power until after his resurrection from the dead. Right. When he had fully given himself as a ransom for many. And we see all that. Yeah. And I just can't help that sometimes we're so distracted by our busyness that we just really stop and forget the blessing and the power yeah. available to us through Christ. Well, and my point my point with the root the root book is that not in agreement with all of it, but Rook's point is that let's just be careful that we not legitimize all the busyness that we sometimes claim that we are engaged in where we miss a sense of fullness, a sense of, of being fully human, to use your point from the Sermon Sunday, to be fully human is to recognize the fullness of God. All right, Debbie, you had a comment? Um, this isn't the first time we see a crowd and Jesus is coming toward a crowd, and then we see people hush somebody who's on the floor on a mat, in a corner, calling out to Jesus. And uh, I don't get why people are so rude like that. Um, but, you know, it's because that crowd had expectations of what Jesus was going to do, right? And they thought he was somehow interfering with the mission and this gloriousness. And then the second thing reminds me of when Jerry's lesson taught us that, you know, a ton of Jesus' good works and plans that he did to heal people, he was on his way to do something else. Yep. He took the time to stop to respond. Um, so. And so, yes, and so, that, that is, that's a good thought to have, is that on the way to doing something that wasn't, un that, that was important, he's interrupted by people quite often. So, so I better be willing well, to well, what is, what is fullness? What is fullness is an, a willingness to be interrupted when we believe God is present in the interruption. And so that's, a, that's a probably a good thing to consider as we move forward. Go ahead. Go ahead. To kind of go along with your book, Being Too Busy, the blind man, I imagine, spent years concentrating on listening. I'm sure he did. I'm sure. So therefore, he learned a lot, or he heard a lot of scripture. Mm. He heard a lot mm -hmm. of, and he heard a lot of the people <clears throat> talking about what Jesus had done. Good. That's good. That's right. Good. And I think you're you're talking about the book being too busy, but sometimes we're, we're too cluttered to sit and think and ponder on things like he had time to do, and he wanted. He knew he. I think he had put most of the puzzle pieces together, yep. and when he said, "I want to see the Savior," yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that. It's very good. All right. So, can we not? Can we acknowledge tonight as we leave? There, is, there isn't very much complexity in what it means to follow, right? I mean, there's complexity with what it means to really follow. What it means—the challenge put forth by Mark as Jesus prepares to enter Jerusalem. He wants you to be the reader to be caught by. There is very much some complexity with, with not only who Jesus is, but what it means to follow, and what it takes to follow, and what it means to really follow, right? What it means to really follow. Okay, so let's leave it with that. Okay, let's go ahead and try to work that out. Okay, thanks everybody. All right, thank you. <laughs>